All right, let's jump into this idea of channel bonding. As we've talked about a few different times, including the intro, if we take a couple of smaller channels and combine them together, we can make a larger channel. In fact, we can do this several times. We can make some really large channels, the 80 and the 160 megahertz channels. And so let's go ahead and take a look at what exactly channel bonding is, how it works, and also what are some of the ramifications if we choose to do so. So how exactly does this channel bonding process work? Well, we understand that for the most part in the wireless world, we have channel sizes of, well, we would call 20 megahertz. We also understand that in the 2.4 gigahertz space, this is actually 22 megahertz. But we typically call them 20 megahertz channels, and we understand that they're slightly larger than that in certain circumstances. And the goal here is to take two adjacent channels and to bond them together. And so in the 2.4 gigahertz space, for example, I've got channels 1, 6, and 11 as my primary non-overlapping channels. And so I usually draw them out like this. And so these are the channels, and I'm going to be able to take two of these channels and bond them together. And so each one of these is, well, again, we call them 20 sometimes, but we know they're 22 megahertz in size. And so if I combine two of them together in what we'd consider to be a 40 megahertz channel, it might look something like this, where I combine channels 6 and 11, and we make, basically, we're using all of the OFDM subcarriers between those two channels. And so we have this very large 40 megahertz channel that's able to now carry more data. This becomes even more evident when we really look at the details of how OFDM functions. And by now, we should probably be pretty familiar with this. We've talked about it from a number of different angles. We understand that there are 52 different subcarriers that are carrying the data. And that's what we primarily care about. Now, we also understand that there's you know, four pilot uh, subcarriers. There are eight unused or guard subcarriers. And so when we're combining these, we might expect that, all right, so I've got 52 subcarriers here. I've got 52 subcarriers here. And so I end up with 104 different subcarriers that can carry my data. And so I've doubled the throughput. Except it's actually even better than that. Because a few of these guard type of subcarriers in here between the two, remember, we, this is all per channel. So I've got eight in here and I've got eight in here. And some of those guard bands are really used at the start and the end of our channels. It's to make sure that, for example, over here, over on the left between channels one and six, uh, that we wanna make sure that channels one and six don't interfere with each other. And so we've got a few different of these subcarriers that we're just not going to use on the lower and higher ends. Well, these between six and 11, these guard bands we might as well use. We don't need to worry about uh, channel to channel interference, I suppose, between six and 11, just stepping on each other's toes there. And now it's all one big channel. And so we can recover some of these. And so what we end up with are the two sets of 52 data subcarriers that we originally had. And then we can add in four of those guard bands and we end up with 108 data subcarriers on our bonded channel. Now, anytime we bond two channels together, we are going to have the concept of the primary channel and the secondary channel. And so we need to understand what these are here. We'll just cover the primary channel first. So one of these channels, let's say channel six, is going to get designated as the primary channel in this situation. The primary channel has a few different roles. First of all, it's going to be used for the management and control traffic that our access points are sending out. And the primary reason for this is we need to think about legacy clients. Legacy clients, maybe in this case, they're only able to support 20 megahertz channels. And so our access point is capable of sending out now this 40 megahertz channel, except our legacy clients only being able to do 20 megahertz channels, it's gonna have to pick one of the channels to be on. And so this is going to become part of the primary channel. So in our case, it's going to join on channel six, and it's not going to use or pay attention to channel 11 in any way, because again, it's a 20 megahertz device. This is why it's important that our management and control traffic go out the primary channel so our legacy clients can hear those management and control packets. At this point, the legacy clients will continue to broadcast on channel six, whereas our modern clients, they will be able to use the entire 40 megahertz range. Now, one other thing to consider is that if we have a modern client, so our modern client is presumed to be using the 40 megahertz channel, if it's listening to the airwaves to make sure that it can talk, remember we have to take turns, it might actually detect that, for example, channel six is clear. We'll say this, channel six is clear, but channel 11 is not. Well, if channel 11 is not clear, then I'm still capable of sending out on my primary channel, which again, in this case is channel six. And so even my modern devices will use the 20 megahertz channels if needed in order to maximize the use of my airspace. Certainly we could continue to wait for the entirety of our 40 megahertz channel to become available, and then we can spend, send twice as much data that way. 
However, why not send some of our data across the 20 megahertz channel, and then next time the entire space is available, then I can go back to 40 megahertz. So now let's talk about the concept of the secondary channel. In our situation here, channel 11 is going to be the secondary. The secondary channel is just the other channel, and so when we're combining two channels together, there will always be a primary, and the other one will be the secondary. The secondary is essentially just extra bandwidth. We're just saying, hey, if you are ready to communicate, and you're running on our primary channel over here, well, you can use the secondary channel if that space is available, assuming once again that you support the 40 megahertz full channels width. However, there is one property that the secondary we should be aware of, which is the concept of the offset. The offset is essentially saying, okay, so here's my primary channel, where's my secondary channel? It does need to be adjacent to the primary, but is the secondary channel over here to the left, or is it over here to the right? And so if it's over to the left, we call this a negative offset. And if it's to the right, we call it a positive offset. And so unfortunately, the negative offset concept kind of sounds like it's a bad thing. It's just paying attention to which direction we go. So once again, in our example here, we've got channel six as the primary. If I had bonded over to the left, for example, and made channel one the secondary over here, well, at that point, we would have a negative offset. However, in the example we've given, which is channels six and 11, well, this is a positive offset because our secondary channel is higher than our primary channel. So that's well and good. Now let's consider what happens when we have 80 and 100 megahertz channels because it's great and all to talk about primary and secondary as if they're all 20 megahertz channels individually, but now we can make a lot of 20 megahertz channels into this bonded channel, not just two. And so for example, with 80 megahertz, we're talking about four of these channels. And with 60 megahertz, we're talking about eight of these 20 megahertz channels. Well, first of all, we are going to get the same effect as we talked about over here with OFDM. We're gonna get even more subcarriers out of bonding multiple channels together. The other thing to consider here is that we probably can't do this in the 2.4 gigahertz space. And we've got a drawing right over here that demonstrates this. I've got three separate 20 megahertz channels, again, 22 megahertz channels, but even if I combine all three of those together, I'm only going to get up to 60 megahertz and that's not good enough. So you know, 60 megahertz, that's not going to be an option here. So we can't even consider deploying these larger channel widths into the 2.4 gigahertz space. So at this point, we're gonna be talking about deploying these into the five gigahertz band or possibly the six gigahertz band. So let's say we're in the five gigahertz space at this point, we've got these four different channels aligned right next to each other. Well, now we can bond all of these together. And so I've got one bonded 80 megahertz channel that encompasses all four of these 20 megahertz channels. But now how are we going to handle the conversation around primary and secondary? Because things are definitely going to get a little more interesting when we have four of these channels happening at the same time. Well, this interestingly, it's going to actually break down a little bit further for us because this 80 megahertz channel is actually going to consist first of all of two 40 megahertz channels. And so internally here, we're actually running two separate 40 megahertz channels that are themselves bonded 20 megahertz channels. And so this 80 megahertz channel is going to have a primary 40 megahertz channel, and it's going to have a secondary 40 megahertz channel. And all of the same rules that we talked about down here are going to apply. Furthermore, our primary 40 megahertz channel is going to break down even further. We're going to have a primary 20 megahertz channel, and we're going to have a secondary 20 megahertz channel. And so this makes us backward compatible on several levels. For example, if I have a legacy client and this legacy client is actually capable of going up to 40 megahertz channels, so maybe this is an 802.11n client since that's the largest channel bonding that we could do back then. Well, at this point, this legacy client could actually attach still to the primary 40 megahertz channel. Furthermore, if we have legacy 20 megahertz clients out here, well then it can still attach to the primary 20 megahertz channel. That's a derivative of the primary 40 megahertz channel. And so what we're finding here is that we have this hierarchical concept here that we see going extending down from the 80 megahertz channel. Now, all of these concepts are going to apply to the 160 megahertz channel as well. It's going to have a primary 80 megahertz channel and a secondary 80 megahertz channel. Then that primary 80 will have a primary 40 and the primary 40 will have a primary 20. And so once again, we see the hierarchical nature happening here, which is how we go about supporting all of the different types of clients we might have in our wireless environment. Now, one last note here, when we're talking about bonded channels. We have to consider what we call the clear channel assessment or CCA. We're going to go into the details of what this means later on in this course, but ultimately we've talked about this in some amount of details by saying 
that we know that we need to take turns in the wireless space. The reason we need to take turns is because there can only be one talker at a time, otherwise it causes interference. So if we're gonna take turns and I'm ready to send something, the first thing I'm going to have to do is listen. I'm gonna have to listen to the airspace and decide if that channel is clear. Well, that's exactly what the clear channel assessment's going to be. It's when I'm listening to find out if that channel is available. Well, when I'm using bonded channels, bonded channels are going to be more difficult to make sure that they're completely clear. And the reason for that is because there's that much more space to listen to. So if there's other devices in the area that happen to be on, let's say this 20 megahertz channel right here, maybe they're on a different access point across the building, but I can hear some of them. Well, the reality is I can't use that part of the bonded channel. And so maybe I can use the primary 40 over here, for example, or if it's a 40 megahertz channel, I might be able to use the primary 20 megahertz channel. But the reality is that this assessment becomes much more difficult the larger my channel bonding sizes are. And so we might actually find that we increase what we call the bandwidth here, the range of the frequencies, but we end up actually dropping our total throughput. We have to be very careful whenever we're doing wireless deployments because we don't want to make a bad assumption. We don't want to assume that, hey, these 80 and 160 megahertz channels are always the solution for our problems because we might go to the 80 megahertz channel solution and we find that our throughput actually goes down. The busier our environment is, the more likely we are to encounter something like this. So let's just make sure that we're doing our proper due diligence when we're considering deploying bonded channels into our environments. So there's a lot to review here. Let's make sure we've got it all down. So when we combine two or more channels together, this concept is known as channel bonding. We've talked about this a few different times throughout this course already. And so we're just taking a look at it a little bit more details here. But we see a 40 megahertz channel comes from 220s and 80 comes from 420s and 160 comes from, believe it or not, eight separate 20 megahertz channels. And so channel bonding is going to result in this primary and secondary designation. And so for the 40 megahertz channel size, that's not too bad. We've got one primary, one secondary. That makes sense. But naturally, as we go to 80 and 160 megahertz channels, then things get a little bit more complicated there. And so, for example, the 160 is going to have primary and secondary 80s, but that primary 80 is going to have primary and secondary 40s, and that primary 40 is going to have primary and secondary 20s. And so just understand the hierarchical nature of primary and secondary as well, by the way, as the importance of the role that the primary channel has. Now, lastly, channel bonding, as we see, isn't always the best option. I mean, certainly it's going to do a lot for increasing our total amount of data that we're pushing through, but that doesn't always mean that our throughput increases. If we're, you know, if we bond channels together in a very busy environment, it might actually make it so we're able to use our bonded channels less often and then we would have been able to use these smaller 20 megahertz channels. And so, um, or we might actually expect double the throughput, but we only get you know, maybe 1.5x the throughput. We just don't quite get double like we expected. And so just understand that, you know, there's implications of going with channels or bonded channels like this. It's not a one size fits all kind of situation. It's not just a perfect fix for every environment. However, naturally, if we can take advantage of bonded channels, we are going to see our throughput uh, increase as long as, again, uh, the environment is, uh, I guess, tuned <laughs> to use those bonded channels. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Thanks for watching. Be sure to click here to subscribe to CBT Nuggets and click the notification bell to make sure that you're aware of every time we post new content. If you're interested in a career in IT or you want to brush up on your IT skills, then swing over to our website and while you're there, be sure to sign up for a free trial.